Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Renee Mogensen, and I am a Senior Marketing Programs Manager at a priori. Our topic today is the exhausted engineer. We have scheduled 60 minutes for today's session, and we have a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. We put a lot of weight on the shoulders of product designers and engineers these days. It was bad before the pandemic, but now it's even worse. Layoffs, furloughs, and government-imposed lockdowns have these vital employees trying to work from home, designing innovative products that become more complex every day with less resources than ever before. Can you relate? Now, with manufacturers struggling to make up for lost revenue and profits, engineers are being asked to do all of that in less time to try and keep up with smaller, more nimble competitors that have already fully embraced the concepts of digital transformation. Many companies have processes and cultures that have built up over decades and are hard to change. Adopting modern technology to improve the profitability of products and the efficiency of the design and delivery process is very challenging for many. But what if there was a way to increase the percentage of new product designs that were optimized for manufacturability and cost and reduce the time it takes to deliver these new products to market, all without impacting the workload of your engineering team? That is what we are going to explore today. We have two experienced guest speakers with us to speak to you about the challenges of manufacturing today and tomorrow in the new normal. Let me take a minute to introduce them to you. Steve Green is a strategic procurement manager at Talus. He has fulfilled many roles as a machinist, as an engineer, as a project manager, and now as a procurement manager, and he is best placed to recognize that the engineer's role has evolved over time and that they are being asked to do more in less time with fewer resources. Dave McDermott. Getting his start as a design engineer, Dave has spent much of the last two decades helping to drive innovation through the advent of digitization in the industry. As a business consultant with a priori, Dave advises manufacturers by identifying business challenges and helping them to envision a custom solution. First up, let's hear from Steve. Steve, take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, as you can see from the sectors um, on the screen, that uh, Talos offers technical innovation across a very broad range of products, from interbank transactions to in-flight entertainment. My particular ex areas of expertise are in sonars for surface ship and submarines, as well as radio communications for surface ships, submarines, and land mobile. I've been mainly involved in the uh, mechanical sector. The sort of technology that not only keeps you, your data safe, but you safe and auto entertains. So my, my background within, within the organization is, um, I've been based on this site in Temple Coombe, which is uh, in the southwest of England for over 40 years now. So I started as, a, as an apprentice, um, initially with views of going into the, uh, the machine shop. Um, but partway through my uh, apprenticeship, the uh, machine shop was closed. Um, we decided to outsource that element of production. So I then migrated into the, uh, the design office, the drawing office and eventually moved into production engineering. And um, whilst I was in the production engineering uh, environment, I became involved in, in actually designing, developing products, and also taking products from um, the design phase right the way through to customer delivery. Uh, during that process, I was also involved in aspects of uh, the test, C trials, also installation. Um, so I've been to, America, Canada, and Australia. We spent a number of months there actually installing our equipment. The beauty was then I was part of a very small agile team and we were responsible for all elements of the product from the bid to the design, also responsible for the budgets. And um, because we were reacting directly with the customer in many of these cases, we understood the value for money that the customers demanded from our products. And basically, we had to we had to deliver what it's what it said on the tin. So the challenge is: so I now sit within the uh, procurement function, procurement manager, and my role is is to basically 
source from the supply chain the the products that our designers are now designing and although procurement is now seen as a vital role in delivering value for money we we don't tend to get invited to the party until it's too late so we're we're being asked to make savings on products where 70 percent of the cost is already designed in internally we we have a what we call different procurement levels so pr level seven is where the product is suitable for prototype manufacture so at that stage it goes out and then up thereafter any changes you need to make have a significant cost impact on the product the issues we have with some some of the, uh, the, the the products at the moment is the the uh, the large procurement team do lack some some uh, some knowledge and some experience in some of our products because we have a very large product range. You don't always expert. You're not always experts in certain areas. So that can lead to um, trying to go into negotiations with suppliers with no real data. Uh, no real experience of what the actual product is and in some cases no real experience on the actual suppliers you're talking to and that can that can put some people in some difficult positions really where they would lack necessarily the confidence to to have a, a more open discussion with some of the um, with some of our suppliers um, from an engineering perspective we also have challenges, especially now that a lot of our engineers are more isolated than they, than they were before. And, and when you come up to try and have a conversation with a supply of an engineer, I've quite often heard from them, you know, I'm the designer, it's procurement's job to buy things cheaper. And they do, they do tend to get quite upset when you start challenging um, some of the tolerances or some of the features that they've designed in, because when they're doing the design on on their screen the products look nice they're you know well rounded the curves it looks aesthetically pleasing the problems what i'm seeing is that you can't necessarily put all those features into a product at, at the right sort of cost so calling their baby ugly does tend to upset some of our engineers um but at the end of the day, we, we do have limited design and cost experience and the ability to do some value engineer value engineering within, within our products. So what are the options? So at the, currently, um, the, cust the customers we, we deal with tend to uh, give, us, give us contracts later than we would like and the time to bring the product to market is shrinking so one option then the business is to to take on more engineers to hire more experienced engineers we then have challenges with the supply chain to actually ensure the parts come in on time um, we, we then tend to bid a bit of risk in the in our proposals as well and this this all leads to a lot of a lot of late change because we haven't been able to have that engagement early enough with the supply chain. And the ultimate way this leads to is 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 the potential the business lose margin. We lose contracts because we're too expensive. There's a lot more internal stress on everyone concerned from supply chain to engineers. And ultimately, the one thing we end up with is, is disappointed customers, which is absolutely something we do not want to do. So, I mean, I, I've, um, over the years, I've, I've learned a lot about um, how to interact with engineers, with suppliers, et cetera, but I'm only one person. And I see the way forward is, is, is we need to re-engage with our, the complete supply chain, right from the designers through to the customers. And, and going forward, we need to have the ability, I think, to develop a true functional analysis. Where, where when we go to our customers, we've got a true indication of what it is going to cost, so the risk comes down, how long it's going to take to manufacture, so the risk comes down, and what we can deliver can be manufactured at the right price in the right time, so our profits go up. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and um, yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you, Steve, for sharing your experiences. 
and how they impact the role of today's exhausted engineer. Now Dave McDermott from a priori will show us a new interaction paradigm that proactively notifies key stakeholders of opportunities around cost and manufacturability. Dave is going to give an overview of how this kind of manufacturing simulation will alleviate a lot of the pressure on the exhausted engineer. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Renee. So I, I've had a similar background to Steve. I, I started my apprenticeship in 86. So I'm not quite as old as Steve, but he, he still runs marathons quicker than me. But yeah. I, I went to the drawing office and I went to production here. And so I learned a lot about the different challenges of making parts. I was in aerospace and defense in the world of radars. And then as a design engineer, I designed hard disk drives. Now, as a design engineer, I literally was exhausted quite a lot of the time. I was the exhausted engineer. I was the one who was staying up all night, literally, in a small company just outside Edinburgh, sleeping on the boardroom table to get a design ready for production the following morning. We just had to do what, what needed to be done. My experience in the world of production engineering beforehand was very valuable. I helped to design cost-efficient parts. But that's not always the case, especially today. And that I've spent the last uh, several years in the world of consulting to look at organizations' approach using digitalization to ensure that products are manufacturable, but also to speed up the process of getting to the ultimate product as quickly as possible. So I'm going to go through some of the concepts that we share a priori with our clients and how they're very important in this new, brave new world of getting to market quicker with the challenges we face today. Now, the challenges haven't really changed from the basic perspective over the years in that we still have consistent pressure to reduce time to market. Some might say that's increased dramatically recently, given that there is more global competition. That hasn't really gone away. Our engineering bandwidth is always under pressure because of economics. There are shrinking organizations. Everybody's been asked to do more with less resource. That hasn't, hasn't really changed that, that general trend. The ability of cost engineering and manufacturing engineering to support the world of design and engineering has changed because those very crucial, important resources are less today, and there's a lot of experience in these kind of people that is starting to dwindle. And some companies are looking at ways to try and keep that experience in the company. They're using technology as well as using development strategies for their people. The modern day apprenticeship is coming back, but there's always a challenge of there's not enough experts. As Steve described, there, there, are, there are engineers in the organization that he works for that he could spend all day with, but he has another job to do. So we can't use that expertise all the time. And of course, there's always something, A, it's COVID-19, where we have a pandemic that is disrupting everything from supply chain right through to remote working for everybody in the business. But there's always something. Therefore, if we want to address these challenges, it's a never ending battle and we need smarter ways. The implications of these, of course, are classic late stage changes, late stage ECOs, as a result of not getting things right is a classic. And we seem to manage that today. We always get to market in time, but perhaps with a compromised product, a compromised price, or something that's not quite what we planned. And then we spend the next few years at value engineering or doing activities to try and fix what we didn't get right first time. That costs money and we miss opportunities, depending on what business we're in. And quite often, the final point here is that perhaps we don't make the right decisions about which programs to pursue, which projects to run, not just whole new product introduction projects, but where do we invest our resources to, to grab market share or to take opportunities that ally out in the world. So these are classic implications and challenges. Now let's look at the engineer. The engineer's job is to go from this page here, from left to right, from nothing to something, to complete. To complete a product, a product design, to go through all the testing, verification, to do the analysis and simulation, to write up paperwork that proves that it's going to be good, 
to make sure we're not going to get sued later on through some sort of litigation. There's so much to do in engineering. That program is one in which our major focus in engineering is, and this is why we are literally exhausted. So let's look at an example of an organization who is going to take this product here, which is a low volume product, and we're going to re-engineer it to be higher volume. We're going to take this to market as something that's going to fulfill a new emerging demand in the world, which is people are doing more DIY. This drill is for businesses who are engaged in uh, building houses, but more and more us homeowners want to do things ourselves. So an expensive product like this, we could re-engineer it as a home product and take it to high volume. And already for some of you in this line of business, you can see the challenges of going from low volume to high volume. We've got some work to do. The journey from left to right is that we need to then complete a design that goes from something we already have, some carryover design, like for example, the chuck of this component is already a standard thing. We just want to reuse that. And we'll re-engineer some of that bar and tube stuff to be to be die cast and make it easier to produce in high volume. That's our job. What we don't want to do is to make sure that when we get to the end of this program here, we haven't missed the release date and we certainly don't want to go over cost because we're going to high volume market and the potential uh, extra overspend is really going to hurt our business. That's what we need to do. Now, if we want to do that smart, we're going to go along a process of designing. We're going to progress the design of the new components. In parallel, the part of the business that Steve represents are thinking about how they acquire those parts we design. And that includes how we're going to manufacture it, how we're going to stock it, where we're going to keep it, where we're going to make it. So to be smart, to make sure we are effective the business, we should ask ourselves these kind of questions in design. What's the best manufacturing major process group to make things in? Fabrication, sheet metal, casting, could we even use composite 3D printing? Some of these emerging new technologies which could be cost effective in certain conditions. At the same time, the purchasing group, and when I say purchasing, again, I mean holistic with the whole people thinking about bringing it to bear operations. What do we buy it in? What volumes? Where do we buy it from? Which processes and machines? As we get towards the end of the design phase, we hopefully are asking ourselves, is this really the most cost efficient design? And do we have the right price we're paying? And the two kind of go hand in hand, as I'm going to describe later on. If we get that wrong, which often we do, let's face it, we always have to do some degree of late stage change as a result of that. Change from design issues, but a lot from manufacturability or cost issues. If we get that wrong, we have to fix it before we commit to tooling, before we start production runs that are going to make us run at a loss for too long. And these are the things that really consume engineering, these late stage changes. These are things that we didn't plan to do. So if you think about that journey as a journey of the development of a digital twin, a representation of the design and the processes for manufacture, then we change these all digitally before we get to the final release. What we'd love to do, because that takes resource and effort, is flatten the end of that life cycle. Taking away late stage change from cost of manufacturing means we've got two options. One, we can move the release date earlier on. And for some industries, that's great. I can get to market early and steal market share, which is extra revenue contribution. That's fantastic. A lot of industries, including Steve's, that we've just heard from, the, the end date is fixed in time. Therefore, we also have the opportunity to do something slightly different. We could do more innovation. I could take the resource I use to fix problems later on and put it earlier on to focus on innovation. Innovation around the product to make it more competitive, but also innovation around manufacture and procurement. I could focus more on how to make this easy to procure and make Steve's job easier by designing out cost. I could also do this with the same resources that I have or potentially fewer if I'm in a shrinking organization. So all I'm doing is taking the same resources and focusing what, on what we're supposed to be doing, designing great products at 
a price that's affordable so we can win market share. Unfortunately, as we all know, there is something that's going against us, which is the ability to actually influence cost and manufacturability. At the start of the life cycle, we can have a huge impact on cost and manufacturability. The decisions we make have a dramatic effect on it. Unfortunately, the availability of digital information that tells us what it is we're actually going to make gets in the way of that. We don't have information to make decisions on. At the other end of the life cycle, we have everything defined. We've got a full digital definition of what we have. Therefore, we can make analyses and assessments. However, it's too late. Too late for making changes. Therefore, we can't have an impact on cost or manufacturability. There is therefore this window of opportunity, this sweet spot where we can, where we are at a point of good information fidelity, the white curve and the yellow curve is where we're just starting to lose the ability to make an impact before we commit to long lead time item, long lead items and to tooling. This little window spans between the first time we have a CAM model, and when I say first time, I mean when we've got a shape on the screen and when we're actually committed to release to production, when it's with ordered tooling and long lead time materials and so on. That window of opportunity is where we believe we can add value as a priori. That's where we're going to offer insight to support this very crucial part in the life cycle where we can take on the opportunities. How do we do this? We do this in a rather simple way. It is, of course, very complicated. That's why we need very powerful software behind it. We basically use the digital twin, the CAD model, and all the information that surrounds it that defines what it is we actually want to make. We simulate manufacturing processes on that, and we cost those processes in digital factories anywhere around the world. Really simple, but difficult thing to do, and that's why we help our clients do it. And then we use that information at different stages of the life cycle. Design is where we're going to focus today, and we run other webinars on some of these other areas that we can help. But today it's all about design and engineering. And of course, value engineering at the end of the life cycle here, this is traditionally where people focus on taking out cost. But if we do this right, and we have the insight early, insight early on, we can do early value engineering to make sure we focus to cost, design to cost. So, that in itself generates more for us to do as engineering, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive. It's not really, because if we do this right, it isn't a burden on this. But what if we could make it even less of a burden for engineering? So we have the concept of what we call cost insight generate, where we automatically analyze parts for manufacturability and cost just as soon as they've got to a certain point in their life cycle and they've gone into a place where they can be pulled from. PLM is a classic area, some sort of PDM environment. And once they're under control and managed, we can grab them and the information that surrounds them, production information, and use that to run these simulations. And when we say automatically, we mean that. There's no interaction from the design team. They just carry on designing. And then what we do with it is identify which parts, assemblies, components, are the ones that are right for design for manufacture exercises. There's something about them we want to identify which ones they are that give us opportunities to reduce cost, time, complexity, that's going to make it cheaper to make, easier to source. We then highlight the important cost drivers in them so we can provide guidance on remediation. And imagine, therefore, if you could then get that information to the right people at the right time. That means we can actually, we actually take advantage of this great insight. So what if we can do that? We a priori are, are making this uh, a reality. I'm going to show you how we do this in actual fact, but most of the work is done in the background. Most of the work is done on a server somewhere that's doing some very clever stuff. The design engineer, which would be me in this case, I create a design and I send it into my managed environment, into PLM. It gets checked in. And then from there, it takes over. So it then gets simulated for its manufacturing process and it generates information with cost, cost drivers, manufacturing process steps, resources required, costs and tooling and so on. That information is then analyzed. 
And where there is something that's not as good as it should be, and there's lots of areas there, it can then post information back into the PLM environment. So we can now join together the design we're working on and the challenges we expect to face on them. And therefore, people can see reports inside there or through email notification on which components require the attention of a design engineer, manufacturing engineer, a cost engineer. And therefore, we only put our valuable resources on the opportunities that we really can exploit. And then we use some of the cost insight tools to understand why exactly what's going on about these and then make decisions and change design so we can get to market with the right product. So let's have a little look at how that happens in practice. I'm going to start off with an email. So I've had an email from that exact same system that I just showed that tells me I need to go and do something. And now that's all. I'm spending 99% of my time focusing on designing this product. And then I get an email that says, you need to look at this flywheel here, this part here. As you can see, it has a DFM risk of high. And that's the cost of that component. So a very small component, only a $2 component. But we're thinking about producing 50,000 of these a year. And if it's not easy to manufacture, that $2 is probably a little bit high. And it's all these little $1, $2 savings all add up. And of course, we can't focus on every component. So that's the beauty of this email. It's telling me this is the one you should have a look at. So when I click on the URL it provides, it's going to take me to the managed environment where this component exists. This component exists in Windchill. Windchill is the managed environment that we are using in our organization. It's a PLM tool, if you like. And Windchill contains the data about all my parts, all my documents, the processes that are driving from my organization. And this is the flywheel part in itself. If I look at the related data to it as it goes through its life cycle, there's one piece of information that's now been attached. As a result of the simulation being done against that part, again, in the background without me doing anything, the report summarizes all the problems that we are going to face. Here's the component itself, information about its title, the volumes it's produced in, the costs, and then the manufacturing issues, and there's a whole bunch of them. Now, I could sit and read this list, but there's a smarter way of doing this. I could use the tools that the system is providing me inside a priori to understand what to do next. So also attached to this part against its information pack is the actual simulation itself. Now we can get to see why this component is the price that it is. So first of all, I see the physical component itself. This is not CAD software, this is not design software. This is the view of the simulation that was run on my behalf as a design engineer. Now you can immediately see what's kind of going on here. This is a flywheel that sits at the back of my drill. It has two jobs. One is to cool the system, and the second one is to add weight into the flywheel system for inertial perspective to keep the motor running when the clutch is engaged, disengaged. So those are the two major functions. It also has to be strong. It also has to resist temperatures, vibrations, and so on. So this is the answer I've come up with. I'm an exhausted engineer. Some might say lazy, but I've designed something which seems to fit the bill. I've put in two enormous weights in here, one of which I've got holes in so I can add balancing weight so that it can be balanced in the secondary process. I also have little ribs, which from an inertial perspective, I've made really thin because I want these to just support my counterweights and add a bit of strength. I don't want them to be heavy because I want the weight on the outside to create inertial mass. I also have the cooling fins themselves, which are classic cooling fin designs, nice and thin, allowing air to flow through. However, on the very left-hand side, you can see the information about the simulation. The first thing it tells me is, this is the process that it's determined it's going to use to manufacture it. It's got, for example, 31 seconds of high-pressure die casting, followed by a trimming process, and then some milling to do some holes and other machining features, based on the tolerances that were applied to this part. It's just worked that out based on some parameters and the CAD model. 
CAD model is the crux of it, but also it knows which major process group it's going to be manufactured in, where it's going to be manufactured in the world, and volume, batch size, material. All this data has come from the world of PLM. That data exists somewhere in my organization. We've hoovered it up in the background and glued it to the 3D model to allow us to simulate the process. We therefore get the cost and the cost breakdown, including the tooling, the tooling cost that doesn't produce this for one tool, but many tools that are going to support the life cycle of this part. We are looking at 50,000 components over eight years. It just worked that all out from the manufacturing simulation. Us and the design team, that's potentially interesting to us, certainly to the, the production and procurement people. The thing that's really interesting as to why the cost is so much. So here is a list of the items that make this difficult to manufacture. And now all I'll do is go through these one by one and see if they apply to me and how I might go about fixing them. The first one, you can see this little red keep out sign here, it's saying that I have geometry that is impossible to manufacture in the die casting process group. You can see these are voids. And anybody who's designed something like this could see why. What I've done is I've created the blades, and then as a sort of lazy engineer, I've just put a protrusion in there to add weight, and it's just not quite touched the fan blade. Now, if I gave this to a die casting supplier, they're just going to say there's no way in the world they're going to want to do that. That's crazy. It's obviously a mistake. But they may take two weeks to get back to me to ask me, are you sure about this? And I've just lost two weeks of time, which I could use to do other things. Two weeks of risk on the delay to the, the first article inspection. And therefore, these little issues that make things difficult to manufacture, while they're not a problem for the manufacturer, they can create time delays. I also have draft issues. And the draft issues are where, again, I've not been very comprehensive, and often I don't need to be. I've drafted, not drafted these big, thick sides here because they're big, thick parts. These fan blades, however, the drafting on these faces and the drafting on my little ribs down here, these are on thin walls. And if I leave it up to the supplier to draft them, they may do it in a certain way that will either impact the yield of the part, which equals cost, because perhaps one in 100 parts will have a deformation at the top of here. And um, also, I may have, again, the tooler, the, the tool maker might take several weeks to come back and ask me what I want to do about it. Same with the thin fan blades. There are other issues in here around blind holes. It's just suggesting that they cost money in tooling to make blind holes. I also have a material thickness violation. It tells me down here that my current max minimum wall thickness is 0 0.4 millimeters. And it says for this component and material, I need to make it above 0 0.5 millimeters. Again, I think there are manufacturers out there who could do that for me, but perhaps the ones I go to can't. Perhaps I limit the ability for procurement to find a supplier because they need a specialist one. They lose the ability to bargain, and again, the cost of the component goes up. All these little things lead to quality, delay, or cost implications to greater or lesser degrees. And if I really want to re-engine this product, perhaps I could sit down with my cost engineer or my manufacturing engineer to do it. But remember, this is the only part I'm looking at today because this is the one that's come through the system and said it needs some attention. And there are other features in here. Now, there are other tools that we could show in another webinar that show you how to explore the thicknesses and the details behind it. But let's just assume we've understood what problems are. Now we need to go and fix them. So I'm going to use the design tool, which is Creo, to fix my problems. The first thing I've done is I have gone and changed it by removing the counterweights. So I've taken them out, and the component now has no big blobs of material, which are also a problem, especially when they're close to thin walls. What I then did was change the size of the fan blades to make them thicker. So my fan blades are now considerably larger, and it might look a little bit chunky. But if I think about it from a fit form function perspective, I now have all the weight around the outside. I also thickened up this underside edge here. I have all the weight around the outside, and I still have 
tooling capability. In fact, if it was really tech, really detailed, I would change the size of these leading edges as it's sucking air out the middle and make those a little bit thinner. But in actual fact, this may pass my CFD. It may still do its job. It now has the right inertial characteristics that are the same as the old one, but with a more uniformly fit component. That, that is good. I only knew this because I could have sat down with an expert or because a priori has told me these are the things I should go and think about. And then once I'm happy with a design, I then want to check it back in for simulation again. Now, I have several options here. First thing I need to do is log on. This, this is a, a lot. I'm logging into a secure web environment. I'm using the security of the web, which is good enough for the serious organizations of this world. And it means I can put it up into an environment where it can be dealt with. The cloud will take care of this and take the burden of what I don't have to do. The first thing it does is it uploads the physical CAD file itself, the geometry, to go into the simulation. And then it starts running the simulation process. And it's doing this on my behalf. While it's doing that, I can carry on exploring design options to see what else I can look at or even look at new designs. This is what it's doing in the background. I'll pull up the window here for you to see. It's translating the geometry. That, that means it's taking all my fillets and surfaces and turning them into walls that will inject molten aluminium through to understand the nominal thicknesses where there are restrictions to look for all these challenges that it's already given me information on. It calculates how long it's going to take to melt the material, to let it cool down inside this component with its different thick, thin areas, and the cost for doing all the manufacturing features like holes and so on. And it's done that within about 28 seconds. Now, that's 28 seconds that I didn't have to do anything. It's just done it. And it now has a new costing and a new simulation for that component. But, but let me be clear, I don't need to look at this. All I need to look at is the emails that it generates. But here's a scenario where I'm working on my own or perhaps with a cost engineer to find the ultimate design solution. So I can make design changes, try out the simulation, make another tweak, try out the simulation to get to the ultimate product design, especially if I'm going to make 400,000 of these components over their life. Inside here, it provides me with the information that from the result manufacturing process but the thing we're really interested in is what's happened to the design guidance it's gone from critical to just here are some things for you to consider it still has the draft angle challenges i still haven't applied draft to these surfaces but you know what i don't need to this part is so thick and uniform the supplier and the toolmaker can work out themselves it doesn't matter how they apply the draft to those faces they're big enough and ugly enough to take care of themselves, so it will be fine. And sometimes if I think about the design from this perspective, I can make the toolmaker's job easier, save time there, save cost, and so on. And that's why the cost has is, is come down. The, the other thing that I want to highlight is that if I'm not a manufacturing expert, perhaps I've got some experience on this, but if I'm not, there is guidance Everywhere we go through this to, tells us why these things are a problem, why thick and thin walls are an issue, why the draft is a problem, so that design people can have the guidance to suggest why. And we can learn from this. We can also ask questions as to what I could do next. It provides some remedial advice to solve the problems. So we have a new design, which is easier to produce, more cost effective. But, but how cost effective is it? So let's, let's compare the old design with the new design. So I'm going to run a comparison between my original flywheel and my new one. And then you can see side by side the differences between them. So the left hand side is the original one where we have the critical issue on the right hand side is the new one. So the first thing to note is that the fully burdened cost was originally 202, is now $186, it's come down by 8%. Over the life of that part, that represents $64,000. And that's just one tiny small change out of a sea of thousands of components in different products that we produce that can be found without me having to invest any effort. $64,000 have been found, 
with two or three minutes of design change and the system working out where I need to go to find it. That's very powerful. That allows us to focus on cost. From a manufacturability perspective, one of the reasons that that has come down is that the cycle time has gone from 60 seconds-ish down to about 43 and a half. That gives us the ability to go to more suppliers who have more capacity to make these components. It gives us more options. Procurement will be happy because they've got more people that they can negotiate with and find a good price. On the subject of price, also the way I designed it, this manufacturability issue allowed me to look at a design for manufacturability issue, which is material. So I've gone from 200 grams to 190 grams of material because all I just all I did was move the material from the inside to the outside. And I did this because I'm not being a lazy, exhausted engineer. I'm being focused on manufacturability. Uh, and in doing so, uh, and I'm able to do that because I've found some extra time. I don't have to fix this kind of problem later on when it's really difficult. I have time now to do this at this point in the life cycle. And as you can see, all the other parameters have come down. I can see what the process is behind that and why. So that's how we get a component to get into its PLM world. It can be simulated, and then the results of that can be presented to people, not just as a list of here's the thousands of things you can look at, but here's the one opportunity for us to make savings. Of course, there are other people in the business whose job is to do exactly that who's to find the needles in the haystack to solve problems. Those people have the ability to analyze and simulate an entire database of information to look for those needles. Here, for example, I'm gonna run a report on not just this product, but all the die castings that have been designed in our organization before we've committed to production and look for needles in haystack. Look for the ones where we can save money. This is a graph that plots weight versus cost. And as you can see, there's a sort of correlation, especially in die casting. But there are components that slightly buck that trend. And the color of this bubble represents how easy it is to manufacture. Now, rather than looking at reports that come from PLM, I can be more proactive and, and start to decide where I could focus my attention. The size of the bubble represents the size of the spend. This is a component with low DTC score, in other words, it's easy to make, but it's got an annual spend of $201,000. That's why it's a large bubble. So perhaps my value engineering team, which have got more time now because they're not supporting design so much, that's where they could go and focus. How could I get 10% out of the cost of this component? It's designed well for manufacture, but there are smarter ways of designing it perhaps, or manufacturing it. Here is my flywheel, the original one, which wasn't designed so well. Its manufacturability score is now relative to a world of other potential challenges in this. So that's how we can have an impact on the time and the energy of engineering. Engineers no longer have to focus on manufacturability and cost so much. They can be informed of where the, the, the direction is going wrong. Of course, there are organizations who are very mature about this, who already focus design engineers on cost and manufacturability. It's just part of the role. They even have measurements and KPIs around that. So they are doing this to you anyway, but they can now do it even smarter because they just get an email that tells them what to do. So what would it mean to you if you could automatically look for these needles in the haystack? these opportunities that are already in your PLM environment that we can find. And then for those, find the ones which are really gonna have the impact on the business from easy procurement through to easy cost, best cost. And then find out which drivers are making this expensive or difficult to make and then guidance on to how to remedy that and then get the right information to the right people so they can do it before we commit to production. And that's a priori's view for how we help organizations face the challenges of a competitive world. Thank you, Rini. Okay, thank you very much to both Steve and Dave for sharing your experiences. Excellent demonstration of how modern digital manufacturing simulation can be leveraged to alleviate problems for all you exhausted engineers. 
Um, at this time, we'd like to take a couple of moments to respond to some of your questions. The Q&A panel is still open, so there's still time to answer your question. We did have a couple of questions that came in while you guys were presenting. Um, Dave, I think this first question is for you. Um, there are many tools out there that already give good DFM guidance. How is this different? Okay, okay. Um, it's a fair question. First of all, as already highlighted, I don't have to be as proactive. I don't have to do this every single time I'm looking at part. I don't have to run tools to go and do the analysis. The other thing is when the DFM guidance comes, it's coming with cost information in parallel. And in fact, the two go hand in hand. Some guidance around manufacturability, like those, um, those draft surfaces, for example, they might appear like problems, but they may not be. And we have to make that assessment. And sometimes it requires looking at what the actual impact could be. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Therefore, why don't we get some other system to go and work at what the real impact is? So while there's lots of other tools that do DFM, and we embrace these as people in engineering, this is another way of using a similar capability, but more powerful, but also in the background. So we don't, we can be less proactive and we can focus on engineering, that's what we're trying. But that, that's my view of it. Okay, the questions are flying in. <laughs> um, let's see, Dave. Um, does the software provide an option for customizing DFM rules? Ah, good question. The, the DFM rules can be customized in various ways, and there's a lot to that question, and certainly worth exploring a conversation if you wish to talk to Apriori. Some of the rules are based on manufacturing standards. For example, you would go to a grinding process on a component this size once you get over a 10 micron uh, flaps tolerance. And therefore, the, the guidance from DFM for machining would change based on the limits of production. Some producers can do things very well. I know a company down in the south of England that can machine things you wouldn't possibly believe they could machine because they are very good, good machines, very careful. Their standards for manufacturability are much higher than other companies. So we can customize it to account for the fact that different companies can do things to different levels. We can also generate slightly different rules. We can make things crop up that are perhaps more important to some organizations. Others more bespoke rules as well. So it can be configured to suit the, the aspects. And that's important because some of our clients are in nuclear. Some of them are making plumbing fittings to go into the hidden systems of our bathrooms. Okay. That answers yes. the question. Next question is, will the design engineers have to set manufacturing location for the parts in advance? Will the cost of the part change with location? Yeah, so first of all, the cost of the part absolutely changes with location dramatically in some cases, depending on the part and the material and the cost drivers. The design engineer does not have to set that. And this is an important part of our principle of cost insight generate is that that information lies somewhere else in the business. We suck that information up into the simulation from PLM or other systems that contain it, and we suck it into the cloud and do the simulation now. All the design engineer needs to do is check their part into PLM, we take care of the rest. Joe asks, how do you handle routing changes, such as plating and painting? I see secondary processes. So I just looked at a basic example here. Also, in our other business systems, we have information that suggests about the other processes that are going to be used, and they go into the costing as well. So I just looked at die costing, a die casting. It can be a die casting with secondary painting on it as well. That information can be found, found and applied to the simulation. Of course, to make life easier, if that information is not so easy to find, we can have component class types based on a classification that we can search on to say, if it's of this type, like an external component in a production in a product, it always gets painted. And we can run a simulation on the painting cost as well. And the manufacturability around painting means the bigger I make the surface area, the more painting I've got to do, and therefore the cost goes up. So those can be found and added into the simulation too. Does this work for assemblies as well? 
If so, what type of information is generated on the assembly level? Okay, so for assemblies, the guidance we're going to get on assemblies is breakdowns of where the cost splits are. These are the main levels. The, the assembly techniques of welding, fastening, bonding, uh, riveting, all these are costed as well based on certain parameters like the number of rivets. Every rivet will get a cost assigned against it and we'll build up a cost for that assembly. And then we can see the breakdown of cost. This is very important for people who are looking at casting versus fabrication, especially in, say, oil and gas. We've got low volume, heavy components. It can do a breakdown of the costing for an assembly and show you where you're spending too much time assembling and not enough time making metal bits. And you can then decide, do I make that from fabrication? And then I can run the same simulations of casting and compare the two, and perhaps as a trade-off at one point, or sorry, a switch over where I go from one to the other. So yes, we do do assemblies, and the guidance is mainly around where the different costs are attributed, and we get insight from that. Okay. When do you define the VPE, the volume, and the batch sizes? Okay, again, that's taken care of by Cost Insight Generate, and, and I know this person's asking this because they know how Acrory works. And um, it is the is defined by cost insight generate it sucks that information from the plm world and it brings that in and it does a, a, a mapping so where it sees this value in the system it will make an attribute an a priori to say use this vpe or digital factory use this volume so we find that on your behalf in your systems and then use that to run the simulation so again just to be clear the design engineer doesn't do anything. They don't have to type in stuff that they don't frankly know about or care about in nine times out of 10. That's not their job. So we do that. How is the manpower cost calculated if involved? Okay, uh, the manpower is part of the digital factory. So it uses the concept of a factory in say Thailand, and it knows the average labor rate for a factory in Thailand and it takes a cycle time that it calculates, 36 seconds for that die casting, and that's based on the simulation and said, well, that's labor cost, 36 seconds, plus the labor cost of setting up the machine, plus the labor cost of trimming, by access, inspection, painting, et cetera, and they all have slightly different labor rates. But if that person wishes to talk to us about how to build up the cost, that we've, we have a fascinating way of doing it. It's a very powerful simulation that, that will get to the bottom of that. So that's how it finds and uses the labor cost. And by the way, that labor cost could not just represent Thailand, it could represent an exact supplier in Thailand if we know their labor rates. And we can create digital factories that represent exact organizations. Here's another question actually that just came in about labor rates. How often are your labor rates, material rates, equipment rates, et cetera, updated? Okay, so four times a year, we will produce a new set of data and we, we gather this data through various consultancies and agencies around the world to build up a picture of what it looks like every, every three months, four times a year. That's all very well for high volume savings, but how does it help low volume manufacturers like us? Ah, uh, fair question. Yeah, high volume is an obvious opportunity. And low volume, in the organizations that have high value, low volume, there's still lots of money to find. And if you think about, say, oil and gas or nuclear, we're producing one or two sets of very large expensive parts that take an awful lot of effort to get to the point where we manufacture. If there's something wrong about it, then we've, we have to unpick so much that it can really impact our program. So time starts to become important. But even just a large component, we take 10% out of a 30,000 pound component, that's a lot of money. So low volume, High cost is where we really want to look for some savings too. If I spend 100,000 on a casting, uh, I want to look for taking three or 4,000 out of it. I mean, certainly in Steve's world, the, the, the sort of stuff in the world I'm used to, aerospace and defense, some of the volumes aren't very high, but the costs are astronomical. These companies spend billions a year creating a handful of products, and they are always looking for the needle in the haystack too, because they have the same pressures as the high volume manufacturers, Cost times marketing. So, uh, slightly different ways of approaching it using this technology, but same idea. 
Okay. Um, we still have a number of questions, but I think we're going to we're going to call it here. And if we weren't able to answer your question on the webinar today, we will email you within 24 hours. You may hear directly from Dave um, or or someone else here at a priori. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Our webinar is now concluded. I'd like to thank you for your participation. And if you have any additional questions, please reach out to Dave McDermott. His email address is listed in the next slide. Have a good day.